<clears throat> as a new year approaches, often it's a time, isn't it, for optimism and hope, looking forward to what the future holds, a time to plan, a time to set goals and new resolutions. But the way the world is at the moment, considering perhaps what is happening closer to home as well, it may seem very hard to be optimistic. Israel and Hamas are at war again. Thousands have died. Many more have been wounded. Thousands, perhaps millions, are struggling with the daily necessities of life. Russia's invasion of Ukraine is ongoing. They're still at war, and it seems as if it's unending. And at home, I know some of us will be facing a first Christmas uh, with an empty space at the dinner table. Some of us are facing chronic illness, perhaps that cannot be cured, that we have to live with, or perhaps we're worried about a diagnosis we're awaiting, or a lack of diagnosis for the symptoms that we are suffering. In such times, with these events, with these troubles, what can we do? Big question is, in the midst of the storms of life, what can we do? So this morning, I want us to consider, very briefly, the good news of the sovereignty of God. The good news that God is indeed in control of all things. And I'll do that as we turn together to Psalm 93. Perhaps turn to Psalm 93 in your Bible or on your device, so you can follow it through as we look at it together. But first, I will read it. <clears throat> the Lord reigns. He is robed in majesty. The Lord is robed in majesty and armed with strength. Indeed, the world is established firm and secure. Your throne was established long ago. You are from all eternity. The seas have lifted up, Lord. The seas have lifted up their voice. The seas have lifted up their pounding waves. Mightier than the thunder of the great waters. Mightier than the breakers of the sea. The Lord on high is mighty. Your statutes, Lord, stand firm. Holiness adorns your house for endless days. This psalm teaches us that we, that you, you can rely on God whatever storms, whatever turmoil, whatever afflictions you may face. But why? Well, we're going to see three reasons why we can, why we must rely on God. First of all, rely on God because he's the majestic king. He's the majestic king. This is where the psalmist starts. This is where we need to start with the truth of the godness of God. If you play video games... You might have gone and looked up cheat codes on the internet and you can enter a cheat code which maybe gives you access to a hidden part of the game or gives you some special powers and sometimes it lets you enter what is called God mode. And when you're in a video game in God mode, you are invincible. You cannot be defeated, you're all powerful. It lets you do whatever you want to do in that game. And that's what we mean by the term God, isn't it? To be God means to be all-powerful, to be almighty, to be above all else. Listen to what the psalmist sings. The Lord reigns. He is robed in majesty. The Lord is robed in majesty. 
and armed with strength. The Lord, that is the God of the Bible, the God of Israel, and our God is truly God. He reigns. He is the king. He is supreme over all things and everyone. And he is robed in majesty. He wears all of the dignity and the authority and the stateliness and the grandeur of majesty. He has an awe-inspiring, jaw-dropping presence and splendor. He is robed in majesty. But this is no empty display like the robes our king might wear. This is no pretense of power. He is armed with strength. He has all of the power needed to back up his majesty. He rules. And the world itself may seem rock solid as we look at the mountains and so on, but only because God has made it so. The steadfastness of the earth proves that God himself is rock solid. He is firm. He is secure. He is dependable, unmoved and unchanged by circumstances. The world is established, firm and secure. Your throne was established long ago. You are from all eternity. He had no beginning from all eternity. There never has been a time or a moment when he was not. His throne, his reign, his rule, His sovereign and omnipotent rule was established long ago when he created the world and everything that is in it. This is the truth of the sovereignty of God, the godness of God. Quite simply, it means that he is in charge. He does as he pleases. No one, nothing can stop him from doing what he wills to do. No one can oppose him. And so, therefore, he is the only being in the entire universe who is truly free to do whatever he wills. And that is a great comfort, is it not, to God's people, to those who will rely on him, to know that in all of our difficulties and afflictions and the trials of life that we will face, that in the, amidst those, our God reigns. That he sovereignly ordains whatever comes to pass. And we see that what he wills, what he decides will happen, is ultimately for the good of his people. Because he is not only sovereign, but he is love. Even the difficulties And sorrows and afflictions that we face, they're for your good. In all things, Paul writes, God works for the good of those who love him. In all things, God works for the good of those who love him. Do you believe that? Do you believe that this morning? You can say yes. In all things, God works for the good of those who love him. So rely on God because he's the majestic king. Secondly, rely on God because he's mightier than the storms. He's mightier than the storms. Sometimes life can be really rough, can't it? Really difficult. Whether that's just looking around the world at the international conflict and war that happens, which often comes close to home with people amongst us today being affected by it. Maybe you have family affected by it. Then there's the threat of global catastrophes that hang over us all the time, it seems. And of course, close to home, there are the trials and the suffering in our own lives and the lives of dear family members and friends. Mark's alluded to some of those in his prayers. 
And these things, these trials, these afflictions, these troubles, they loom large in our view, don't they? They're like the mighty storms and the swelling waves of the ocean. And as we face these overwhelming storms, we may be tempted to despair. The psalmist sings, the seas have lifted up, Lord. The seas have lifted up their voice. The seas have lifted up their pounding waves. It may be fun to go down to the seaside when there's a storm and stand safely on the promenade and watch the waves crashing into the seawall. But what if you're in a tiny boat being tossed about on the ocean by those waves? Or stranded on the beach as the waves come crashing in over you? We often find ourselves in that boat in the storms of life, don't we? I'm sure we all know those times where we're being tossed about, as it were, by the trials that afflict us, and we don't know where to turn. And the noise, the noise of our troubles, the way they speak to us, can be as loud as the crashing waves, the thundering seas. They can drown out everything else. It's the only voice we hear. We're in the middle of these trials, and all we can hear is the crashing waves and the pounding storm. But over the sounds of the storm, we must hear the psalmist sing. Verse 4. Mightier than the thunder of the great waters. Mightier than the breakers of the sea. The Lord on high is mighty. The seas may lift themselves up, but the Lord is on high and he is mighty. The seas may rush and roar and crash and pound, but the Lord is is mightier than they are. Whatever you face this morning, whatever you will face in this coming year, and we cannot predict what will happen, can we? Whatever you face, he is mightier than your illness. He is mightier than those people who may tease or mock you for your faith. He is mightier than any and all troubles that you may face. He's mightier than the Russian army. He's mightier than all of the rulers of the earth combined. He's mightier than the storms. Rely on God because he's the majestic king. Rely on God because he's mightier than the storms. Thirdly, rely on God because he's building his church. Rely on God because he's building his church. This final verse, verse 5, seems to come out of nowhere. What's the connection between verse 5 and the, the first four verses? Well, the connection is simply this, that like his throne, his word stands firm. Look at verse 5. Your statutes, Lord, stand firm firm. Just as God is sovereign, he is in charge, he is in control, we can also know that his statutes, his laws, his decrees, what he says stands firm. What he says goes. His word is true and trustworthy and reliable. Whatever he says he will do, he will do. You can believe his promises. You can live your lives on the basis of what he says and what he promises. 
in a very real sense. The way that God rules, the way that God reigns is by and through the word that he has spoken. And his sovereign power and his trustworthy word can be seen in what he is doing. He is building his church. Read with me again verse 5. Your statutes, Lord, stand firm. Holiness adorns your house for endless days. Another version puts it this way. Lord, your testimonies are completely reliable. Holiness is the beauty of your house for all the days to come. The house of God is made beautiful by God's holiness. But what is God's house? Where does God live? Well, in the Old Testament, they built a temple, and the temple was called the house of God. That was where God was said to live and dwell in the midst of his people. The temple was a sign that God was with them. And the beauty of the temple was ultimately not in its magnificent architecture, although it was magnificent and beautiful. The beauty of the temple was that it said, God is here. A holy God is here. A holy God is among us. A holy God, one who is totally unlike any other being, utterly unique in being and majesty and a pure and good God of inaccessible light. This holy God lives with his people. But that Old Testament temple though it was glorious and splendid, was but a mere shadow of what was to come. The reality came in the person of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, born as a man, coming into the midst of his people, becoming one of us, coming to live with us, God with us, Emmanuel. And his holiness, his, the beauty of his holiness, shone as a bright light in the darkness of a dark world. We read in John's Gospel, the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. Jesus himself said that he came as the true temple. He is the fulfillment of that Old Testament temple and what it foreshadowed. But now in Christ, through faith in Christ, we are the house of God. If you're trusting in Jesus Christ, if you are a Christian, you are the house of God. You are where God dwells. Paul wrote to the church in Corinth, God's temple is sacred. God's temple is holy, and you together are that temple. He wrote to the church in Ephesus, in Christ... The whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. And he's talking about the church. The church is the holy temple, God's holy temple. And it's beautiful. You are beautiful this morning. You might think, I looked in the mirror and I ain't beautiful. The church is beautiful. Not these four walls. It's just a rain shelter. You, the people of God, who have faith in Christ, you are God's temple, you are God's house, and you are beautiful. 
What makes the church beautiful? Well, I'll read verse 5 again in that alternative version. Lord, your testimonies are completely reliable. Holiness is the beauty of your house for all the days to come. It is God's holiness. It is his abiding presence in and through the Lord Jesus Christ with us that makes the church beautiful. This is where the sovereignty of God and the purposes of God he's revealed in his word come together. The sovereign God, he is building his church to be an everlasting house. As it says in verse 5, for endless days. The one who holds us in our hands, the one who lives among us, who makes us his house, he is the supreme ruler of the universe and of heaven itself. So nothing and no one can take you out of his hands. If you are his, who will take you from him? He's mightier than all. See, if God were not sovereign, we could not be safe with him. But because he is the sovereign Lord, because of the good news of the sovereignty of God, we're safer than houses. Mark quoted earlier from C.H. Spurgeon, I'm going to do the same. Uh, a Baptist preacher in the last, well, the century before last now. He said this. There is no attribute of God more comforting to his children than the doctrine of divine sovereignty. Under the most adverse circumstances, in the most severe troubles, they believe that sovereignty has ordained their afflictions. That sovereignty overrules them. And that sovereignty will sanctify them all. There is nothing for which the children of God ought more earnestly to contend than the dominion of their master over all creation, the kingship of God over all the works of his own hands, the throne of God and his right to sit upon that throne. So we come to a new year with all the uncertainty that that future holds, all the fears and doubts that we may already have, in the midst of the storms that lift themselves up to tower over us and to thunder out their threats, what do we do? Do we look to ourselves? Do we look to other people? We rely on a sovereign God. We rely on God because he's the majestic king. We rely on God because he's mightier than the storms. And we rely on God because he's building his church. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that you are the one who is robed in majesty and armed with strength. Help us to trust you in the midst of the storms. Help us to listen for the voice of the psalmist above the noise of the storms as they hit us. Thank you that you are building your church. Thank you that you live among us and in us, that you make us your home. Thank you for the Holy Spirit who indwells us and brings you and the Son to live with us. Help us to continue to rely on you and to help one another to rely on you and help a fallen world to see 
that you are the only dependable thing in this world. Amen.